My guest today on Dan's podcast is uh, April Gornick, uh, a, a very successful painter who lives in Sag Harbor with her husband, Eric Fischel, who I think uh, about a year ago was voted by Sag Harbor, that she doesn't even know about this, that she should never leave Sag Harbor. We oh, have to refrain what? from having her leave because of the work that she's <laughs> done over the years, in recent years, to make this, bringing in uh, some of the uh, remarkable amenities that hadn't existed until that time. And uh, I will mention some of them. Um, there's, um, you restored the uh, movie theater. Um, you, you, built, you bought a house that became a, a literary uh, kind of a writer's place. I don't know how that's going in the pandemic. Across yeah, the street, you bought, you bought a former church and converted yep. it into a, an art center. Um, and you were very instrumental, I think, I'm not sure, but you were probably instrumental in just about any other thing that was done, including John Steinbeck Park. Uh, it's been quite remarkable. And I would like to ask you for starters, um, how, how, how long have you lived out here and what got you so interested? First is a question to answer. And the second is, and how did you get interested in from being a, the painter that you are in, a, in a, going off on this remarkable tangent? Um, well, um, let's see, I got, I've been here part-time since from 1985 to 2004 and then full-time from 2004 on. And my um, trajectory was um, after 2004, when I was living here full time, I became a lot more aware of oh, various things like the CVS wanting to take over the 7-Eleven building. You remember that, 2007. So I, I got very involved in that because I, I had fallen in love with Sag Harbor. And, you know, gradually over the years, I learned more and more and more about Sag Harbor history, how exciting and kind of eccentric it is. I just really wanted to, I really wanted to know more about it and immerse myself in it more. So I was, um, it just sort of naturally happened that being a, a person who when they see that or think that something is wrong, when I jump in and try to help fix it, that's just, it's always been me. I was kind of an activist in New York um, when I lived in Manhattan, I was a member of the Women's Action Coalition. And so, you know, I mean, I just jump into things. And the outgrowth of that was the, the magic of being able to do something when the opportunity presented itself, because I'm, I guess I don't shy away from large projects. No, you don't. <laughs> when, when, um, when Jerry Mallow and his wife, um, Francoise, um, came to see me in July of 2016 and said that they were, they had now made the momentous decision to, that they were going to try to sell the cinema to a not-for-profit so it could remain a cinema. I just, and, and they said, and we just, we just were at that big party for the park that you did. And there were so many people there. And we think that you and your organization can do that. That's meaning the Sag Harbor partnership. Right. I just went, yes, we will <laughs> without having <laughs> asked anybody which is a no-no in an organization, but I knew that everybody would be enthusiastic. And that was a big lift that I didn't, you know, I didn't really anticipate the extent of it, as you can imagine, but um, I make really large paintings that take a lot of patience. So I guess I'm kind of, you know, wired for that in some way. And then unfortunately, I must say that the writer's house that we had at 31 Madison, which was a wonderful place and which is something that Eric initially bought because he was hoping to um, have an artist residency somewhere in Sag Harbor. It was a longstanding dream of his. And so we bought that and it wasn't perfect for it, but the house was so wonderful. It used to be Hal McCusick's house. For people who don't know, Hal McCusick was this great musician. I know. Who he played with all the greats. I mean, he was an amazing person and a great woodworker and taught at Ross School, saxophone and music. And um, he had he had preserved the house so lovingly and we didn't want it to be messed around with by somebody else. So it was kind of a double opportunity to 
step in and save the house and make it into this great writer's thing. But a writer's, originally it was an artist thing. And then we realized that it was really much better for writers. Every, every person that we knew who was a writer who walked into that house fell madly in love with it. Yes, I, mean, I was there for the old. Like, they would just sit there and start writing practically. <laughs> it, was, it was really in the bones of the house. Um, much as the much as the diversity of things I think are in the bones of the church now, but and so when the church came up and we and we wanted that instead because it was much better for our community slash our art slash history blah 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 purposes being much larger and affording more space and being suddenly on the market again after three different owners. We just jumped into that. And Eric was dead set on keeping 31 Madison, which he still regrets not having done. But I, there's a limit to how much money you can spend. I mean, we're not, you know, don't make any mistake. We had enough money to do that, but we are not, you know, I don't want to name names, but we are not some of those really mega wealthy people out here. So um, anyhow, we, we ended up trying to get someone to take it over and run it as a writer's center, but we couldn't find anyone. So we ultimately did end up selling it to nice people who seem to have kept it very intact and now have that cute little shop that sells pies and things where the studio had been and the, work, and the workshop before that. But now it's all about the church. So we're deeply, deeply, deeply involved in that um, on a day-to-day -day basis. I mean, it's, it's a lot of work, but it's a thrilling project and it's, been inspiring for us and I think for the public getting through the pandemic to have this new fabulous thing in the village that allows for so many opportunities of every sort. So I'm super excited about Is that. Is the church, uh, the former church finished or are you still working oh. on the church? Yes, Dan, have you been? I haven't, that's why I asked. <laughs> Shame, shame. No, it's, it's we've been open for a, just a little over a year, oh and we have done we have done everything from museum quality art shows. We'll be we'll be opening our third, absolutely museum quality art show on June thirtieth. That's a that's a show called Threading the Needle. It's about the way that contemporary artists have have mashed up crafts and fine arts and are making these totally new objects by using traditional craft materials like weaving and sewing. And it's, it's going to be a fantastic show and a lot of fun and a lot of surprises. When is it opening? It's opening June 30th is the opening. It'll be like a 46 or, you know, something like that time. And then, um, and then we are, but we've also done all sorts of, of things like we had, I don't know if you know this, I bet you don't, that the world's foremost diamond counterfeiter lives in Sag Harbor. And we have a program called Knowledge Fridays. And we had him give an hour long talk about his work. He's replicated the hope, and he works for people like De Beers. He's not a criminal, <laughs> mm -hmm. but he's, he did, he's done amazing, amazing um, work. And he's, he's replicated um, the Hope Diamond, the Kohinoor, um, in more than one of its stages. He's, he's an absolute scholar about gemology and geology, and he gave the most amazing talk. So it's between museum quality art, music and dance performances. You've missed all of this. Um, and then somebody like him. And then on our first anniversary, which was April 15th, um, we also had Lisa Field come and talk about how, when you talk about Sac Harbor having a kind of resilient history, let's get somebody there who has actually lived it. And Lisa F Field is the embodiment of that because she and her family for 52 years have kept the Sac Harbor Variety Store, AKA the right. five and time going. Right. And the anniversary of the Variety Store is actually as a five and time, Five and Dan, 10 starts in 1922. So this is its 100th anniversary. So we had an anniversary party for both our one year anniversary and her 100th anniversary. She gave a talk, she showed all these fantastic, like really old pictures of her and her family and the store, like from when way before they bought it. 
and how their family kept it going. And she talked beautifully about, about the family's commitment and the fact that the inventory is largely the same as it's been for the last 80 years. And then we had cake and it was super fun. <laughs> it was great. So we're doing all these things that people don't anticipate and don't associate necessarily with serious events at a serious place, but we're, we're having fun. We're learning things. We're educating. We're, you know, it's a, it's a joyful endeavor with a lot of um, is there, content. Is there going to be, or is there a place where writers could write in that, in that complex? Yes, there is. We have a residency. We have space for four um, writers and or artists musicians, composers, computer scientists, animators. We can have anybody and we, and we wanna have everybody. We would love to have cross-pollination from people who end up being residents coincidentally with each other. Um, that of course is not something you can orchestrate, but we wanna make that kind of interaction available to people. We also had a creativity conference last March, which was fantastic with six different um, scientists of very different sorts. There was a, a dream expert, a woman who studies dreams. There was an entomologist, a bug expert, um, a guy who was an extreme climate um, science person who is a doctor who studied the effect of extreme climates on the body um, and, and talked about his experience in Everest and the, literally the worst storm ever recorded on Everest. So, I mean, you get the picture. It's really broad, and but it's all about creativity. It's not just, it's not an art museum just, and it's not an exhibition space. It is only, it is something that is about creativity in all sorts of different forms. Because we think that Sag Harbor is a very creative community. It it's is. always been where people make things. You know, we've always been a, a maker place where people made watch cases and Alvin Silver, <laughs> you, know, you know, like um, tableware. And that's that's what Sag Harbor is. It's in its DNA. Well, you also have been arranged um, to have all that, some of that kind of thing done at the movie theater upstairs. Um, oh yeah, the, the movie thing has been amazing. And listen, everything that I've done has been with other people's help. Sure. I mean, I'm no kind of a one person band here, but um, yeah, the cinema has just really got its legs now. We have a wonderful ED, Genevieve Villaflor, and we've been doing, um, we have a guy named Bill Collage on our board, who's a screenwriter, a very successful screenwriter. Yes, I know him. Yeah, he's just great. Um, so Bill Collage has been um, in contact with um, the East Hampton Star and Dan Rattray, and they've been in touch. And Dan, you know, has been working with, Jen, um, sorry, Donna Marie Barnes at Sylvester Manor on the Plain Sight Project. So the cinema has expanded its um, involvement into that project. So we're we're making inroads in various different parts of the community on all sorts of different levels. It's Did very you, exciting. Have you had any involvement with the, the new park down by the water? Just at the very beginning, you know, like I was, I was really super excited about um, being able to buy that land because in, and I want to give a shout out right this second to people like Molly Duganis. I don't know if you knew Molly Duganis. She was married to Peter Duganis, who was on village boards here in Sag Harbor, but she, she knew about a guy named Michael Maiden, who with some other investors had bought up all that land where the Remkes fishing building was and all of that stuff. And they were gonna turn it into a wall of condos. So there would have been like I where remember. the Allison buildings is, but it would have gone from all the way from the bridge to the end of that area. So um, I was thrilled when it seemed like it was finally going to be preserved as a park. So yeah, I was really excited about it. Now I'm, I'm a little worried about what's going on down there because the, the, the new people in town are <laughs> not being very forthcoming with their plans, but that's all I can say about it. Well, I thought I that was a very interesting thing that happened down, down there uh, with Bay Street. My view of it was that um, 
uh, Bay Street got all excited about what they wanted to do uh, by having a place down there. And they went ahead with it without, uh, be before they approached the town about what they wanted to do, they had actually worked out the whole waterfront <laughs> and uh, where everything was gonna go. And then they went to the village and the village said, wait, that, that's our job. You know, and, I, you, and they, were, they had already purchased uh, some buildings for where the, some of the merchants would move. And, and so it, where is that situation? Where does that sit now as far as Bay Street is concerned? Because I know Bay Street for a while was also concerned about the movie theater. I mean, there's a lot of back and forth between a lot of these groups. Yeah, I don't know what you mean by them being concerned about the movie theater, but um, what do you mean by them con being concerned about the movie theater? Well, they were theater? concerned that, that things would go, there would be things at the movie theater that would uh, duplicate what they were doing or take away from what they were doing. Oh, we told them that there would be no, none of that and there has been none of that. And no. I hope that now they yeah. see that there's none of that, but I, you know, I, I wish them well, but I don't, I'm not, I have wondered aloud whether they're being somewhat manipulated for a larger land grab that's that's imminent in the village. And I hope that's not the case. And I definitely want them to stay in Sag Harbor. I think they do fantastic um, children's programs, educational programs. I think that's a tremendous asset to the village and I'd love for them to stay here. And we think of them as sort of being the anchor at one end of the village. And then the cinema in the middle and then the church and the library and the whaling museum are all oh, at the no. other end. It's, it's a nice, it's a beautiful thing, but not at the expense of having suddenly have to have the Sydney Opera House completely eradicate all the view of the harbor by yeah. being yeah. right there. So, you know, it's just within reason there, there has to be some sense of scale that that responds to the village and its character and its makeup and its history. And what had been proposed, in my opinion, was extraordinarily out of scale. So, but I don't wish them ill. I really hope that they can work out something that's- I was that remembering the first inkling of uh, when things started going south with the movie theater, when, uh, uh, Brenda, Sche Brenda Scheider came out of a yoga class to discover they had taken the big sign down with a neon and, there, and okay. Jerry Mallow was, putting, were you around for that? And Jerry Mallow was putting up these plastic sign, plastic letters and they had to steal oh, them away from the guy who was putting them up and they hid them in the whaling museum for a while. It was quite an adventure. The town just showed up and, and it rallied around that and from there, it it, uh, it it came to you know when there was the fire, and then now, with what you've done, it's uh, something to yeah. see in in the in the village. Well, of um, course, that had that had nothing to do with Bay Street at all. That was just like that was just one of those super weird moments where I I never did ask in my many conversations with Jerry. I never did say, what in the world was the deal with the sign coming down and putting something in its stead? Uh, didn't you think that people would go crazy? But um, good on Brenda Seamer for having like spearheaded that whole effort. I kind of watched it from afar because I wasn't yeah. involved that, in- that's, that's a motivation for, that's a mo mo one of the things that mo probably motivated you in some ways um, is uh, reasoning for doing that was they were cheaper. And, uh, the, and the signage was old and they were afraid it was going to rust and fall down soon. So yeah. she just went ahead and, and did that. And eventually the money was raised to pay for the restoration of that sign. Right. And I think uh, Christy Brinkley bought those, some of the old letters, which were, uh, I don't know where she has them now, but she, it was she the, still whole has, the whole village. She still, has, she still has the H in Harbor, I know. But apart from that, I don't know what else she has. But we, you know, we, I wasn't that aware of that whole effort. It just seemed like it happened suddenly overnight. But in 2009, um, when Jerry first put the movie theater on the market with a really big ad in, I think it was the post, yeah. it was, was going to be sold. And um, I and a bunch of other people just scrambled together and, and made this ad hoc group called the Cinema Project. And we were going to try to buy it then. 
and save it as a movie theater and keep it intact. And that was before Brenda redid the sign. So um, that, but we, but we didn't succeed because we just couldn't make a deal with him. So that was why, that was one reason to me why it was so exciting in July of 2016, before the fire, he came and said that he wanted to sell it and that he wanted to preserve it as a theater. So yay, but, um, and now it is, yay, double yay. <laughs> it's very exciting. Is, is yeah. there something new that you're working on or are you pretty much uh, committed to the, the church? Right I'm now, committed to the church, but is there some other thing on your plate right now? Yes, actually, because the the Stein the Steinbeck House, um, yes. which about this. So we um, we took this on. We we joined with Catherine Zoka at Canio's Books, who had the idea initially that it must be preserved. She was the first person I knew that. I, I think we should explain to it. people watching this that John Steinbeck spent the last ten or fifteen years of his life and wrote books here, and he's uh, you know, won the Pulit won the Nobel Prize for literature, and he's very yep. very well very famous uh, writer from the thirties and forties. And yeah, it's hard to imagine that people don't know who he is, but of course, young people wouldn't necessarily. And one thing that I found out working on this project was I didn't know that he is still the most widely read American author to this day. There are fan clubs, John Steinbeck fan clubs all over the world, like Singapore and Holland and all this stuff. I mean, to me, I was very surprised because I think of him as being from an older generation, but he still has like, a huge effect and following. And um, he won the Nobel in, 19, I think it was 1962. He had written yes. Travels with Charlie here and the winner of Our Discontent, which was what he won the Nobel for, winner of Our Discontent specifically. Yeah. So, and Sag Harbor had a huge effect on him and he was... He was one of those rare people that comes from outside of Sag Harbor, but gets along with the locals because he spent a lot of time with the black at the Black Boy Bar yep. with his dog Charlie and hung out there. And um, people liked him. And he was asked to he was asked to be the the head of the what became Harbor Fest, which is a yearly festival that we have every September that's just a really fun fall festival and there are whale boat races and things. At the time that he was asked to be the head of it, which he did only very reluctantly, um, I think it was largely just a little whale boating and picnicking or something like that. Yeah. But, um, but he, did, he did do that and there's a plaque to him in his honor on the windmill down, at, down right by where the races take place and whatnot. Well, his house is, is a private home now and the, uh, his studio, which is an oct, it was at uh, six sided, I believe, that he built, uh, is right it's on the edge of the water of, of the pond of in Sag Harbor, near where the, the the radio station is on that same body of water, and it's going to be tricky to get the part the uh, uh, the get this done. I think. I well, hope well, it doesn't the turn out that we just can manage to move the house and put it somewhere else but that we could actually buy the whole property would be wonderful. Well, that's what we're working on with the partnership. And um, I'm working closely with Susan Mead and Diana Howard and some other people on this. And where we've gotten so far is that the, we're hoping that we can give a suitable price to the seller. The seller is actually representing a trust of Steinbeck heirs so he's interested in getting uh, an adequate amount for the, for the house that will satisfy everyone in the trust. Sure. Um, we're very, very close to making an offer. And um, we're, I mean, we're really close, but we want to make sure that, that we do this post haste because it's not going to be on the market forever. It is, um, it, it's down to 16.7 million. And obviously that's, in our view, a little high with help get to that. And we do have um, community preservation funds. Yes, I was gonna ask about that. Very, we're very lucky that the town of Southampton has stepped up. And then we have a consortium of people that are 
um, have made pledges to provide some money. We have over a million dollars from private individuals. And um, we also have, we first went to um, Stony Brook University, of course, to see if they would be interested in um, running the writer's residency. And they were not at that time interested, although now they've expressed a lot of interest in being part of the advisory board and the, the Steinbeck Writers Retreat, as we hope it will be called, would be run by um, the University of Texas at Austin, which has enormous Steinbeck holdings. So when we went, entered into this project, we looked for universities that had successful writers programs and had considerable Steinbeck holdings and understood his worth. So we talked to people at San Jose University and also Stony Brook, um, Stony Brook was first, our first stop. Then um, we also spoke to, as I said, um, San Diego. And then we ended up contacting um, the UT and the Ransom Center. So the Ransom Center is a place that spearheads a lot of writers' residency. They're probably the most successful writers' residency university in America. So it was very exciting that they showed interest and now we're thrilled that Stony Brook wants to be more involved in an advisory capacity Absolutely. because we don't want to do this without a, you know, a considerable local input. And the, the net effect would be, I'll just wind this up really fast, but the net effect would be that it would be like just a few residents a year, it would be extremely low impact. Right. Um, and residents would have to interact with the community, go to schools, give talks, go to bookstores, hang out at local bars. I want to see them at <laughs> work. <laughs> You know, so that's 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 the idea. But yeah. there, are, everybody's being great partners now. So we're so close. So if anyone's listening to this and has a spare hundred thousand dollars or so, <laughs> you know, we're well, trying. We're just trying to close the deal. Well, I want to thank you for being on the podcast. I'm talking to April Gornick, and we kind of run past our time, and um, um, we have to. Well, maybe we can do this again some other time too. Uh, a little chatter box, I think you've noticed. Sorry. <laughs> so, uh, so uh, again, thanks for being on, and uh, we'll oh, stay in touch, and uh, we'll we'll talk again another time. I'm so glad you're wearing my favorite hat on you, Dan. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you look great. Bye -bye. You take good care. Thank you for inviting me. Sure. Bye bye. Okay. Bye.